about a, a minute past and uh, it looks like we've got quite a few participation uh, participants in the webinar already. So hello everyone, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Welcome to our webinar, Turbocharging Neurology Research into Clinical Practice. What a fine title. Look, uh, pretty much everyone on this call understands the scale of the challenge. With uh, all the appropriate focus on COVID-19, it can be easy to lose sight of the epidemic of mental health and brain diseases around the world with this often quoted statistic of over a billion people suffering from some sort of neurological disorder. Look, so much great research is going into these brain disorders, but translating that great work into effective therapies and clinical practice has proven notoriously difficult. So how do we improve the situation? And can data in the form of you know, big data and AI, sorry, technology in the form of big data and AI play a part in addressing this challenge? I can think of no better panel to explore this fascinating topic than the one we have today. So moderating the discussion today is my good friend, Dr. Matthias Goyen, currently the Chief Medical Officer over at GE Healthcare. Joining him on the panel is Professor Natalia Rost, MD. Uh, she is the Stroke Division Chief at MassGen and a Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. Also joining from MassGen is Dr. Brian Edlow, who in addition to practicing as a critical care neurologist, is the Associate Director for the Center of Neurotechnology, the Director for the Laboratory of Neuroimaging of Coma and Consciousness, and Director for Neuroimaging of Critical Care Research. Matteo uh, Mancini joins us. He's a research fellow at the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and he's an innovator that recently took a leading role in our Iron Track Challenge. And last, but by no means least, is Vesna Pachotska. Vesna uh, gained a PhD in biomedical engineering and a postdoctorate in neuroscience and neuroimaging, amongst many other accomplishments, before going on to be a co-founder uh, of Cumenta and is the CEO. Now, you're all in listen-only mode at the moment, but do please ask questions via the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm going to be monitoring those questions and uh, we'll select some to put to the, the panel towards the end of the session. So, you know, with that, um, let's get into it. Let me hand things over for the next 30 or so minutes to Matthias. Take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot, Glenn, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. When we talk about artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and the future of healthcare, we talk about big data. The amount of data that is being developed in healthcare is just mind blowing. In 2010, it took three and a half years for medical data to double. Only 10 years later in 2020, last year, it was 0 0.2 years. 0 0.2 years is just 73 days, two and a half months. This is from now till the end of May, unbelievable. There are close to 6,000 medical journals being published, putting out nearly a million articles a year. And the last number I give you, a radiologist looks at an average of 50,000 images in a 12-hour shift. 15 years ago, it was only 500. So let me start by asking you, data is obviously exploding. It's growing exponentially. How are you dealing with this avalanche of data? How are advances in data management and AI changing your daily um, uh, practice, your world, you know, knowing that neurologist has a, neurology has a real data challenge? So if you could talk to that in the context of bringing brain research into clinical practice. Natalia, would, would you like to start? Thank you, Matthias. Um, of course, uh, first of all, thank you so much for asking me to participate in this important discussion. Um, you are hitting it, uh, you're hitting a nail on the head, so to speak, in the, in the field of clinical research. Obviously, clinical data itself as a, as a, as a compendium of, 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 uh, of data points is growing. But I think that the researchers, particularly clinician scientists, are dealing with that uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a more pronounced way as we are accumulating their momentarium of uh, clinical uh, neuroimaging, uh, genetic uh, data points that are uh, you know, enhancing the opportunities for research, but also creating additional problems uh, for data management and handling, processing, and of course, making sense of that data. As a, a stroke researcher and uh, um, investigator in the field of neuroimaging analysis for patients with uh, actual clinicals, stroke, uh, we are continuously struggling with this issue. And I think one of the, one of the um, you know, 
clear passes for success in my career was um, aligning uh, with uh, comp computational scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the CSAIL, um, working particularly with Paulina Golan's lab in uh, neuroimage analysis, was really um, my, my ticket into creating um, manageable uh, way of looking at the big data in my clinical space. And I think that, you know, this alignment, this cross-disciplinary collaborations is what really helping clinicians uh, working out, uh, you know, solutions for managing this data. Great. Thanks a lot, Natalia. I'm looking to Matteo. How are you kind of digesting, you know, all these data you're dealing with on a daily basis? Yeah, thanks, Matthias, for uh, the the question, and thank uh, thank you, thank you all for having me here. It's great to give a more technical perspective on this matter. Um, as a, a neuroimaging researcher, I guess that I have to say that uh, having a lot of data is kind of a superpower. But uh, I would like to quote both the Spider-Man comic book and my colleague Nikola Stikov saying that with great power comes great responsibility. So with, uh, um, when we harvest a, a lot of data, then we are left with a lot of challenges, starting from uh, how do we handle all these massive data sets? How do we preprocess all of them and we make sure that uh, we don't have uh, issues in the preprocessing and also how do we put together data from different sources, how we harmonize uh, those, uh, those data. And, and I guess all these challenges are, uh, are uh, very exciting but uh, requires a lot of work to actually go forward and uh, uh, brings, bring uh, um, tools from the research to, to the clinical applications. Right, Mat Matteo, you're saying you kind of have to marry in vivo and in vitro data, right? And uh, uh, so to be able to probably predict course of disease and, uh, and stuff like that. So, so Brian, so what, what is your take on that? How, how are you dealing with, with the data or, and what do you make all of it? Thank you, Matthias, for this important question and also for the opportunity to, to participate in today's webinar. So there, there are two recent developments that I'd like to highlight that I think are giving us an opportunity to manage and navigate this brave new era of big data that you're alluding to. The first being the brain imaging data structure or BIDS structure for organizing, storing, and sharing data. Um, this is something that's emerged over the past couple of years. Initially uh, in the imaging world, it's now also being applied to electrophysiologic data sets like EEG, TMS EEG. And it's given us the opportunity to share our data by essentially speaking the same language. The directory structure, the file naming structure is now being standardized across labs. And there's an incentive to do so because many journals are now not only encouraging but requiring the open source dissemination of data sets. And the types of sites where we do so, whether it's Open Neuro or the Dryad data repository, they often require that the data are shared in the bids format. And so it essentially allows us to make our data not only available to others uh, to be able to look at, but to actually reanalyze, reuse, to validate results. It allows us as a lab to do the same for data sets that are produced um, by other labs around the world. And so I think this development of uh, the bid structure is gonna play a huge role in allowing us to all share data and to navigate uh, this, this kind of big data landscape together. The second uh, development would be the Common Data Element Initiative supported by the NIH. And I know there are several uh, similar initiatives worldwide, which are allowing us to speak the same language with respect to the types of variables that are being acquired. Um, and if you look at, for example, what's happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been the rapid uh, development and dissemination of common data elements across a broad range of fields, including neuroimaging, again, to try to get the entire uh, community that's studying COVID-19 patients to speak the same language and to share their data. And so I'm not suggesting that these two developments, bids and, and the common data uh, element initiatives will solve all of the many challenges that we face, but I think these are two ways that we as a community will be able to approach this issue. 
right? L listening to you, it seems to me you're all embracing really, I mean, or, or let's say the opportunities that come with, with the big data and, and the enormous amount of data we are having. But um, let, let's say in, in, in clinical practice at MassGen um, um, probably, is, is really everyone embracing it or are there some people might be, you know, reluctant or hesitant? So what, what, is, your, what is your impression? Of course, you are kind of ambassadors. I, I see that, but what's the reality? So well, maybe, Natalia, yeah, I can speak. I can speak on uh, you know on behalf of the uh, perhaps clinical practice and stroke. I would say that uh, we are obviously uh, uh, you know ions away from where we were, let's say, ten years ago, with regard to embracing. Uh, the, uh, you know, the approaches, the machine learning or artificial intelligence approaches uh, in, multiple, in multiple variations in, in our uh, practice. That, that clearly reflects on the way we're using, for example, electronic health records, both for clinical practice, let's say, and research. The way we're approaching uh, neuroimaging analysis right now uh, with all the kind of a back, backend applications that were not available uh, 10 years ago. And, you know, we, for that, so those of us who've done it for a while, you know, we clearly can see the progress in a way people are embracing the concept of the black box, so to speak, and, uh, you know, uh, the necessity of handling uh, uh, big data, the multidimensional data that we're dealing with, and the growing. Um, uh, you know, um, growing accumulation of data points uh, for each individual patients, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. But I do, I do have to say, uh, you know, for, for again, for clinician scientists like me, who's been working on developing bedside applications of, uh, you know, artificial intelligence uh, based um, uh, tools, uh, we are not there yet. We are not quite there yet. And we need to continue uh, to push for practical, pragmatic, um, and uh, you know, uh, reliable and accurate applications that can be can be uh, brought into into practice, as opposed to clinical research, which is always kind of ahead of the curve and at the cutting edge. So I think that there is still ways to go for us. So Natalia, you're dealing with a lot of stroke patients, and I already learned in medical school, time is brain, and of course, being a radiologist, I know this. Could you just give, give us an example how you can leverage big data to probably accelerate the time to diagnosis or how does you, where does it really help you? Where is it science fact and not science fiction? Where, where does it really already help you at MassGen? Well, as you know, some of the most important decision uh, uh, points that uh, you know we arrive at in stroke care is deciding what type of stroke we're dealing with and what can be done for a patient in a hyperacute window of, of treatment. And so, you know, the, truthfully, the diagnostic for stroke in the very early window, when we look at the initial images, uh, you know, whether it's CT. Uh, you know, non-contrast head CTs, you know, looking at the CT perfusion imaging and, uh, you know, looking for large vessel occlusions, et cetera, et cetera. All of those applications are, you know, highly um, uh, integrated right now into our practice. And what one radiologist used to be able to do, we actually can, uh, you know, with a, with a naked eye, so to speak, of a radiologist, we can now have apps Right, that are uh, built in um, in, in, in uh, our uh, both uh, scanners at the hospital. We could look at them on our um, apps on the phones, etc. So th there's there's quite a bit of breakthroughs that can be done, and you know. But I think that we're also looking at the tip of the iceberg. The low hanging fruit has been done. You know, we're we're obviously to evaluate a scan for. A, perfusion diffusion mismatch or something of that sort is now not uh, it's it's built in it's important but it's no longer uh it's no longer kind of a coveted uh you know item we need to look deeper we need to be faster we need to have uh you know kind of a point of care diagnostics maybe even in the field before patients reach the hospital no, that, that's a great point. Now I'm looking at uh, Brian and uh, Matteo. You are all doing, as Natalia does, um, uh, clinical research and you're conducting research studies. So and, and what are you know, barriers of entry when we're dealing with AI? If you could just um, tell us a, a, a little bit and, and uh, you know, that, that would be interesting. So Brian, probably. Thank you. So I, I want to highlight uh, first an important point that Dr. Rose made, which is that we've certainly come a long way. Uh, you know, many of us are, are, are fortunate to be at institutions where over the last decade there have been profound advances 
um, in imaging acquisition and analysis, but we still have a really long way to go. And one example that I would give is uh, the patient population that my lab is focused on, on supporting and studying are those with coma and disorders of consciousness. And there has been recent evidence from a variety of different labs around the world and recommendations from clinical guidelines that in some of these patients, it may be reasonable to obtain advanced imaging metrics, whether it's from task-based functional MRI um, or resting state fMRI, for example. Yet, if you look at the number of institutions and, academic and medical centers around the world who can actually acquire, process, and analyze these types of data, it's very few. And it begs the question, can we use the types of tools that you're describing and that we're all interested in developing to bring these types of assessment techniques to the patients who need them to be consistent with the guidelines. And you know, I look with admiration at what Dr. Rose and her colleagues have done, done in stroke to kind of lead you know, their fields forward and to implement advanced imaging techniques that truly make a difference in the care of their patients. Whereas we in the disorders of consciousness field just have, are not there yet. And in order to bring these types of advanced analytics, even just basic quantitative reports to the image, you know, to our clinical practice. This is something that's not available yet. And to specifically address your question, Matthias, about what are the barriers, a lot of it is just, you know, the tools may exist in research labs, but integrating them into clinical workflows is a massive challenge, logistically, operationally. Um, and then I'll just make one additional point highlighting something that Matteo said earlier about the rapid evolution of data processing. You know, there are standard best practices that are out there. The Human Connectome Project, for example, put out huge data sets with data processing techniques that were state of the art the moment they went online. But then the progress in our field is so rapid that there might be new methods available for, for AI and for machine learning approaches such that, you know, that what, was used, what was previously considered to be a best practice is now outdated within a year. So how do we keep up with the rapid progress in, in research labs? How do we operationalize that in clinical workflows? I, you know, I certainly don't pretend to have the answers, but I, I agree with you. These are you know, incredibly important challenges that we're going to need to, to overcome to bring these tools to our patients. Thanks a lot, Brian. Matteo, what are your main challenges you, know, you face when conducting research stories? Yeah, so um, I want to thank Brian to bring uh, this point up because uh, I uh, absolutely agree that uh, there is a huge challenge where you want to make research end-to-end -end in the sense that you want to both have uh, um, some technical research that then becomes available for people in the in in the actual uh, uh, for actual clinicians and, and I believe that uh, it's very challenging because at the moment there isn't uh, um, a, an actual platform that allows both researchers to actually develop something with their tool of choices, with their programming language that they are uh, um, uh, they, are co they are comfortable with, and in the same uh, um, environment, uh, give the chance of the clinicians to actually use that. Or maybe there is, we will hear probably in a, in a bit. And, and I think that uh, it's very important because uh, every time these days I read a very technical paper, I feel like that uh, some, many of these very interesting papers with a lot of technical background sometimes get lost in the way and they don't actually reach the end point where they actually could make uh, a difference. Right. So I see so many apps, you know, get, being on the market. And um, I always ask myself, are these apps really solving clinical pain points? I mean, quite frankly, is, is this really a clinical pain point or is this an app that, that probably, okay, um, there, there is no real pain point. Now we create a pain point because we have an app. So we have, we have um, Vesna here from Qmenta and uh, I'm asking, I mean, Natalia and, and, and Brian and Matteo, if you had a wish list, you know, um, how can um, companies like Humenta and also um, Big Medtech, uh, you know, help, you know, really solve these pain points or what, what are, where, where, where are areas for improvement? So what's your wish list with regard to like startups and, and, and Big Medtech, Big Medtech companies? Natalia? You? Well, you know, my wish list is very long. I've been working on it for <laughs> over a decade, so get ready. Um, but no, just, but seriously, you know, what I think uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for us is uh, reconciling 
the uh, high science, so to speak, and practical needs of a, of, of a you know of a clinical data analysis. So I you know again I spend my entire career looking uh, at the data that is uh, real time uh, acquired data, which is you know which is a which is not perfect. And so mm -hmm. a lot of apps that are being developed there, or a lot of applications. Um, or a lot of concepts that are being developed are developed on very highly curated data sets. And they suffer from the same uh, problem that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, you know, ivory tower science suffers from is this disconnect from reality of what actually patient care uh, entails. And unless we're able to work with the real life data, that is, uh, you know, the scans that are not ideal in the way they're acquired or in the way they are processed, the scans that, uh, you know, that um, we can make practical uh, healthcare related decisions on, we're not gonna be able to uh, bring these, you know, divide closer. So, you know, so my wish for the research, for the um, uh, 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 developers out there is to work closer with clinicians. And I think that would be, uh, you know, probably first 10 uh, points on my, uh, on my wish list and where we can start developing a dialogue uh, first of all, we'll, we'll uh, as 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 uh, Dr. Edlow referred to, you know, the common vocabulary that we're going to be developing. We need to have a dialogue about what's uh, truly needed, uh, as opposed to uh, building these applications on, uh, you know, on kind of a scientific uh, knowledge, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, foundation that grows, you know, sometimes gets uh, out of touch with reality of clinical practice. And so, having a conversation uh, about what is what is truly uh, uh, you know, the problem of the moment, uh, how to have a conversation in the same dialect on, uh, about it, and what are the real, uh, what are the real steps need to be taken before we can actually be um, excited about a particular application? You know, is it accurate? Is it validated? Has this been tried uh, in multiple independent data sets? And, you know, how do we uh, then disseminate the knowledge? So there, there are a lot of steps need to be developed, but I think that they, they only will come from collaboration between the clinicians and, uh, and the scientists. Natalia, these are really great points. I couldn't agree more. Partnerships are key. Uh, I mean, we have really smart people at GE Healthcare, but uh, if you do the math, the majority of smart people is outside GE Healthcare. So that's why partnerships are really key because sometimes we are so excited that we have developed something great, but I mean, it's, it's the clinicians who decide if this really solves the clinical pain point. Brian, what's on your wish list? As Natalia said, it's basically endless, but I, I guess I know you're asking about specific apps, but I think the point that I would want to, to underscore is that I, I see our current landscape of imaging tools, whether it's in disorders of consciousness or stroke or in the broader you know, array of other neurologic disorders, as like having a smartphone and a bunch of apps where every time you try to access those apps, you know, it takes you a week or you just mm -hmm. can't get them. And you're, you know, that's kind of where we are right now because there are all these great tools that lab, that you know, research teams have developed around the world but integrating them into clinical workflows, to me, is the primary barrier. That's the foundational problem that needs to be solved. How do we get data from a PAC server through some type of platform, whether it's within the PAC server, on a different platform, and then sent back? You know, these are, I'm certainly not an expert in these areas, so I would defer to all of you uh, as far as how to make this happen. But to me, it's the, the, the primary goal should be bringing the many apps that already exist to the clinical realm by establishing these types of uh, pipelines with existing infrastructure. And, you know, I, I recognize that there are FDA approval considerations here. There are reimbursement considerations. Will insurance companies pay for these types of advanced assessments? That's a whole other domain of questions that we're going to have to address as a community. But, I mean, I, I've seen time and time again, clinicians um, wanting to order certain types of tests, trying to order those tests, and for whatever logistical or operational barrier, the technology might not be accessible to them. So um, I know I didn't specifically answer your question about the app, but I just wanted to highlight the point that it's really right. about the communication between clinical yeah. systems and these uh, uh, apps that I think is Absolutely. of primary importance. Great, great, great points. Uh, uh, Matteo, what's, your, what's, your, what's on your wish list? 
Well, I guess I will complete the, the perspective with the technical side of this. So um, when basically someone starts to um, work on a problem and develop a model, and then we probably start to write some code in uh, the programming language that they are most uh, comfortable with. And then uh, at some point it will work, then they will do some tests and then uh, they will be happy with it and they will publish a technical paper. And then uh, is the part where it comes the need for something more because uh, it comes the part where a research needs to be not just a researcher, but also um, a user experience uh, expert and uh, also needs to be uh, a software engineer and it also needs to be probably um, uh, familiar with how to actually the, um, the app will actually work in the wild. And uh, this is asking a lot to someone that maybe is focusing more on either the mathematical side or on the, the acquisition side. And, and I guess it's there that where things get, uh, get lost because there isn't uh, a, an actual way to uh, bring uh, something from the, the bench to the bedside, if, uh, if you right. want. Th thank you, Matteo. Uh, Vesna, sorry, I kept you um, waiting no, for like no. 20 minutes, but uh, now listening to, um, to the researchers and the, and the clinicians, you're an electrical um, engineer by training and uh, yeah. with a PhD in the field of biomedical image analysis. And I, I, like eight years ago, you started um, a Qmentor and uh, uh, together with the clinical partners here on the panel and globally, which points are you trying to solve and, and how is it going? If you could uh, talk a little bit about this Qmentor journey. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, um, throughout my career, especially early stage as a PhD student and postdoc, I really felt this pain uh, to an extent that uh, during my PhD, I, I had to like, uh, back then, 10, 12 years ago, there was not the cloud technology yet. So I had to like bring my uh, desktop computer into the hospital to get to the clinicians and get the same feedback. Even then, this is the best tool that we've seen so far, but the user interface is too complex. And, uh, you know, we cannot just install it in our systems. Uh, and I've learned a very important lesson then uh, that uh, you can easily enter a hospital, but the security thinks that you're stealing a computer when you exit the hospital. But, uh, you know, um, I think that was a, a very defining also point in my career because uh, even 10 years ago, that kind of the gap between the, you know, the, let's say the image processing or now the machine learning AI field, the technical field and the clinical needs was apparent. And we would go to conferences and we would do really state of the art, you know, tractography and segmentation of sensors in like a six dimensional space. And then you go to a medical conference and then they still do brain atrophy and so on. And what is unique, I think, in Qmenta, you know, from uh, my journey, let's say, and the other confounders, Paolo's journey uh, from academia, is that the, instead of you know uh, being another point solution like uh, Brian perfectly said you know instead of being an app on the mobile what we are in Qmenta is uh, you know the operating system of the of, of your mobile mm -hmm. where and and this is exactly what we want to uh, achieve now through the Iron Track and you know through initiatives step by step having this technology that can just um, uh, like the Docker that can kind of froze in time a uh, piece of code that the brilliant engineers make, uh, plug it in the platform and then bring it to the clinicians in a very simple way, you know, where in, in the browser with a, um, you know, radiological viewer such that they can have AI, you know, uh, at their hands without really thinking about the data management and all the hurdles to get those results. So it's, a, it's very exciting to see that you know, the mindsets are changing. Uh, and the technology is very mature. We are living in a time where we have, you know, the cloud technology that can connect different sites and people can collaborate, different, different profiles of people. Uh, you know, machine learning is finally back, back in the day. Uh, you know, it was image processing, pattern recognition. Now we have um, machine learning and deep learning and it's producing good results. And especially if we can validate, validate on bigger volume of data with like different sites, we can have better tools. And then like Natalia said, we need to bring these tools to the clinicians to get feedback and make sure, you know, 
that, that we, we are bringing tools with responsibility, that, that these tools actually make sense and the results are correct. So at QMenta, are you exclusively focusing on neuro applications and for the uh, We are, uh, you know, uh, historically, because of the founders, we're really experts at neuro, but the platform is very general. So, you know, we've worked also with liver trials or other parts of the body. What I like to say uh, is that in, in neuro, you have a multiple three-dimensional volumes that are combined together and if you want to understand what's happening in the brain, you need to connect them and co-register in the right way. Whereas, you know, different areas have different challenges, but um, uh, in terms of, of tools and really expert knowledge, that's something that we are very strong in terms of uh, uh, offerings or um, let's say capabilities of our products. It just have to be, you know, medical data and associated data, so. Right. So, so Natalia and Brian, very, very quickly, I'm, sh I'm sure you work with a couple of startup companies, then you work with corporate America, the big Metax. And is it like when you choose your, um, your, um, um, your partners, um, I, I mean, is it like um, you, you, you look at a special, let's say, solution to a pain point you're having, or is it long-term partnerships? And then you develop something together, let's say, based on your clinical knowledge, let's go into this area. How does it work? Well, I think, you know, I think, again, throughout the years, uh, we've, uh, you know, we've worked with multiple partners. And I think that what, uh, what draws me into collaborations and what is, I think, fruitful uh, from the collaboration standpoint is, again, this uh, first novelty uh, and, you know, ability to, um, ability to apply uh, whatever the developments that the, the, you know, the group is offering us ability to apply to the clinical grade data. Again, real life data, a real patient's data, not, not, not necessarily data that has been curated in, a, you know, in some sort of a research setting, a perfect experiment that cannot be replicated in real life. So we, we want to work with real data. So there has, to be, uh, the, there has to be a promise in whatever the tools or services are offered in that, that they will be applied, uh, you know, across the uh, broad range of, uh, of variability. And secondly, this open-mindedness and ability to evolve together in collaboration. Because if you only bring in your product and putting it on a table, and you know, this is the end of the conversation, I think that, you know, that, that, that would be the end of the collaboration. It's the ability to evolve and answer the real questions in real, in real life, you know, as applied to clinical. Uh, so, so to me, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more of an idea that is able to, you know, able to be uh, kind of weaved into the fabric of, uh, of collaboration and, you know, to answer real questions that we're seeking the answers for. Right. Brian, anything to add? Any thoughts? I completely agree with Dr. Rose. That's very well said. A couple of additional thoughts I would add. And similar to Dr. Rose, we've, our lab has worked with a number of different partners over the years. And the types of things that we have prioritized are ease of use. Is there a graphical user interface that, you know, anybody who's new coming to the lab can learn relatively quickly um, so that it doesn't require, you know, a detailed coding background in Python, MATLAB, or some of these other uh, platforms? Um, can we transfer data securely and readily across collaborating institutions as long as there's a data use agreement in place? Um, that's been a huge barrier over the years is just, you know, some of the, the imaging data sets that we acquire are massive and finding ways to Train, you know, there are whether it's an abstract deadline or a paper deadline, you know, sometimes it really is time sensitive to get those data from site to site. So being able to transfer it rapidly. And then also having permission structures such that as the team grows, as the project evolves, you know, team, everything, you know, in, almost everything in our field now is team science. There are very few things that are done by small individual groups. So being able to add additional sites, additional team members with a simple you know, change of permissions as opposed to having to, you know, go through a long uh, process of recreating the wheel. Those are the types of things that we've uh, prioritized. And I think that the, the time is right to talk about all these, you know, applications, because if there is one good thing about COVID-19 is the fact that it has in, in many ways made clinicians more open to embracing new technologies that can help them to work better. And what is important, I think that 
it's not just you buy a couple of apps and you are done. It's, it's strategy and, and not technology that drives the digital transformation. So it's a real paradigm shift, I would say, a, a change management process that you need the entire organization to buy into, right? The clinicians, the IT department, the technical stuff. People must be really committed. You need, uh, I think, ambassadors or I would say change agents, you know, uh, within the organization who are not only ready to get used to the new environment, but actively promote it internally. And I can tell you, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you are clinicians, but from a radiologist's perspective, all these efforts are only accepted if it doesn't get more complicated. The irony is that while this technology is designed to help productivity, it actually can add more work and complexity. I mean, it probably sounds arrogant, but if there is one more click, a radiologist says, no, I will not use it because I'm, I'm reporting on 50 CTs of the brain per day, so it's 50 more clicks. I mean, so the best AI application is the one that is, that is invisible, that is kind of seamlessly integrated into the workflow, right? Doing the magic uh, um, in, in, in the background. So I, I think this is, this is very important. Vesna? Yeah, no, no. I, I was just curious because uh, I really love this idea, and I, I you know, I, we've connected basically by, by I heard your speech, and I think it, it's it's really the right way to move, um, uh, you know, in this field. And I was wondering, are, are you guys uh, at G Healthcare, you know, with the Addison program, doing this kind of partnerships to really embed uh, AI technology as, uh, let's say, this kind of invisible helper? Yeah, right. It's like an invisible friend helping you um, run faster, right? Yeah. So the Edison, <laughs> uh, we like to name solutions by uh, the name of our founder, Edison. So, so this is the, the Edison platform. It's, it's basically a technology stack that is embedded uh, within existing workflows, right? W one example, I mean, now radiology example is our um, open AI orchestrator. It's a workflow management system that simplifies the selection deployment and also the usage of AI, right? You could say we are bringing AI into the radiologist workflow and radiologists don't even know that AI is working. Then that's the best. If they, if they don't know that AI is working, they just realize that their work list is prioritized and that their tasks are completed more efficient, efficiently. I mean, this would be um, the, the best situation. And by the way, I mean, patients are the winner in this game, right? As, as AI will hopefully lead to a more precise diagnosis, an earlier diagnosis, and a faster time, uh, faster time to treatment, right? So in the, in, in the interest of time, I maybe have um, a, a final question before we move to the Q&A. And uh, so if, if you think of AI and your field neurology, so what is the impact or how does the future of AI look in, 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 in neurology, in your field, you know, in stroke or in, in, your, in your special field, if you will, Natalia? Well, from where I stand, I think, you know, the most important thing is to realize that hopefully in the future, in the near future, AI is no longer a unicorn, right, uh, for everybody. Uh, you know, throughout the past, I would say at least decade or a couple of decades, it's either been feared or it's been adored on the different sides of the spectrum. And we really just need to put it to work. And so, you know, so I think that back end, uh, you know, high volume uh, computational um, analysis that we can build into, you know, to the, um, uh, uh, you know, applications seamlessly, I think should become just a bedside practice. And so one day we'll have uh, clinical research tools that, you know, will allow us prognosticate outcomes after stroke, which is the area of my research, which would be seamlessly kind of taking all the types of data between clinical neuroimaging, genetic, whatever is available, digesting it and giving us uh, very simple directives in regards to how we can approach to patients, um, you know, patients' uh, uh, outcome prediction or, you know, directing the recovery after stroke, et cetera, et cetera. So we just need to put it to work. And we need to, uh, you know, if, 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 there was a, if there was one wish uh, that I could, you know, implement it through is putting the basics of machine learning or AI uh, into a medical school curriculum, right? Or, you know, or training curriculum for, for neuroscientists, for radiologists, for whatever, whatever uh, you know, whatever the uh, receiving end of, uh, of this knowledge. But we need to make it work for us. So that's my conclusion on that. 
Right. Thank you very much, Natalia. Brian, so what role should AI play in the future of uh, neurology? So a few thoughts here. One is I just want to start by saying I would envision that there would always be a role for the qualitative assessment of neuroradiologists. And you know, I see that as foundational to any interpretation. So I don't want to suggest that AI would replace our trusted colleagues in neuroradiology. Um, but as far as the types of roles that it could play, there are two broad categories that, that come to mind. One is lesion detection and measurement. So, you know, if there's a large focal hemorrhage or stroke, you know, most of us can detect that pretty readily. But measuring its size, rapidly calculating its volume when time is of the essence and rapid decisions are being made, um, identifying its overlap with underlying neuroanatomic structures and what that means for long-term prognostication. Those are the types of things that humans can do, but that AI might be able to do more readily or more accurately. Um, particularly with small lesions and in multifocal diseases, like in traumatic axonal injury, patients who are comatose from a car, high-speed car accident, for example, they often have so many of these tiny little micro hemorrhages that the radiologist will say there are too many to count uh, lesions. But you know the act, the quanti the actual number, the absolute number does matter, and the precise anatomic location of those lesions may have profound impact on that person's chances of recovering consciousness, communication, and functional independence. So where we as humans may not be able to you know, sort through that type of information, I think AI can really help us from a lesion-based approach. And then as many of us know, there's a, a pretty strong commitment now to network-based analysis as it pertains to disease pathophysiology, to mechanisms of recovery and plasticity. And you know, that's one area where we don't have rapid enough data processing for structural connectivity data with diffusion, functional connectivity data with resting state fMRI. Those tools exist in the research realm, um, but they're not really readily available to us clinically, much less the quantification of those results into network-based properties that could inform uh, clinical diagnosis and prognosis. So I think in a, in a lesion-based lesion domain and in a network-based domain, AI has a very important role to play in, in how we provide care for our patients. Thanks a lot, Brian. I especially like that you say that uh, um, AI per se will not replace the radiologist or neuroradiologist, you know, but, but I think we, we, we agree that radiologists leveraging the power of AI will midterm probably replace those who don't, right? Yeah. So, Matteo, any, any, any final thoughts? What, what, what does the future look like with AI? Yeah, so aside from, of course, all the exciting development that uh, all the people working on computer vision and, of course, neuroimaging can, uh, can aspire to, I, I guess that uh, one uh, um, underrated outcome is the fact that uh, AI can make uh, the boring parts of uh, working with uh, neuroimaging research quick and painless. I, I'm thinking about how to rapidly uh, uh, find uh, um, issues in your data sets or how to quick segment things that are not your main purpose in your analysis, and then uh, basically let you focus on what really interests you and uh, make you able to answer more complicated questions. Great. So I think we agree the future of uh, healthcare is bright. Uh, I believe that digital solutions powered by AI, AI will become even more important, right? Because they are revealing their great benefits, greater productivity, faster availability, less administrative work, and the spatial separation of physician and patient, thinking of, of COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, right? And uh, I think with that, I hand it back over, over to Glenn for the Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank you, panelists. What a fantastic discussion. The, 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 there are a few questions that have come through. I'll try to navigate who the best people to put them through. Um, this may be one for you, Brian, but maybe Vesna or Matteo may, may, may chip in. You, you, you talked about um, requirement. One of the big challenges around data is uh, managing consistency of data and having the bid structure and common data elements and things like that, which are it, it perhaps allowing some of the foundational elements of this to work. And there was a question, um, um, clearly an international audience saying, well, how is this working across countries? So, so, so is this like an international thing? You know, how are we addressing the challenges of data coming from different hospitals in different countries and different jurisdictions? So I don't know if you've got any perspective on that or whether we pass it to someone who operates in, a, in an international environment as well. 
I'll briefly contribute that I know many people are working on this, especially with the COVID consortia. There are many consortia that are international um, with US, European, South uh, American, and other partners. Um, one, Dr. Rose, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Sherry Cho, who's leading one of these initiatives, I know has dedicated a tremendous amount of effort and attention to overcoming some of these barriers. Uh, I can't say that I know exactly how she has done so. These are kind of ongoing, evolving discussions. And I think we've all experienced in regional or domestic collaborations, how long it can take to get a data use agreement approved um, by our respective hospital lawyers who understandably wanna make sure that all the data sharing is being done appropriately. So these, uh, these initiatives and collaborations are certainly more challenging and complex when they cross uh, uh, you know, international boundaries. Um, exactly how these problems are being solved. I know that a lot of people are working on this. I apologize, I just don't know exactly how uh, what the solutions are. Vesna, do you have a, something to offer there? Yeah, I mean, um, I, th this is one of the big problems when I said Cumente is not a point solution, but we've really invested in the architecture and I'm a big believer that the cloud is the right way to collaborate. And especially if you want to have better AI, we will need to be able to, you know, get data from different parts of the world and, you know, uh, test the AI algorithms of, on these different sites, harmonize the data. And this is what we've implemented in Cumenta and we have international consortia and, you know, we are operating in different geographic areas where, you know, by using the cloud, we actually, we've been uh, cloud native since the very beginning. So uh, when a partner in a consortia or a clinical trial, they, they start uploading their data, we make sure uh, if they want to, that the data stays in the country or even in the states can be allocated, uh, located into the, the, the particular state that they're in. And then to Brand's point on the importance of, of this kind of uh, privilege matrix, you know, we, we can make sure that, uh, uh, let's say only the results are shared, but not the data is not visible between different partners. And like this, we are able to enable, you know, faster the development of AI tools, the discovery of new imaging endpoints. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, you know, that that's the big value that we are bringing on top of what we are doing with these challenges, which are world challenges where you can, we call it kind of like, well, to quote Anastasia, like uh, from, from Harvard, like uh, Spotify for researchers, you know, plugging your tool and then it can be available for the community and then apply across different you know, sites that want to collaborate. Yeah, that's great. And it, it's interesting when you reflect on some of this stuff that um, a, lot, a lot of the things that are put in place to protect us, data privacy laws and, and, and regulations, which um, often vary from place to place, those very things that protect that to protect us often act as a barrier, don't they, to, to um, advancing the sciences. And so there's a clearly clearly an area that we need to work on and this this theme around regulation came up in, a, in another question and um, Natalia I'll, I'll put this one to you um, you, you highlighted you know uh, the example of in stroke care of you know, you know the, just the challenges of getting these stuff into clinical workflows and, and sometimes uh, certainly my experience of this is that the issues whenever you start to introduce AI and things like that into clinical workflows you end up with FDA or others uh, questioning, you know, what's going on. So what role do you see regulators playing um, in this space right now to enable um, big data, AI, these advanced tools to actually have impact in clinical workflows and helping the patients on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think they will play an important role, but I think that what we need to do is we need to step back and as you, as you led the question, Glenn, with saying that we, Sometimes we forget, scientists are excitable, so we forget that they're actually real people behind the data. So it's not just the data, those are, those are data points that belong to an individual who has their rights to privacy in many different ways. And, uh, you know, we need to treat it with the utmost respect with every patient who participates in research. We need to realize that they've made a sacrifice and a contribution for the greater good and treat it with respect. So I think the regulators are doing their job. I do think that we also need to be more um, more proactive in the way we uh, affect these collaborations. You know, the, there, there, perhaps there are some 
um, um, you know, trends that outlive themselves, you know, in terms of the bureaucracy of uh, regulations and those need to be obviously, um, uh, you know, overcome in, in whatever possible way. But it is our job to keep talking to the regulators, also hospital administrators, as Matthias was implying earlier, unless the structure, unless the institution uh, accepts it, uh, you know, a particular application or particular advance as uh, even if it's already approved uh, for use, you know, unless they accept it within their structure, there is no practical dissemination of that tool. And so we need to be aware of that. But I also wanted to comment quickly on the point that uh, Brian and Vesna were making with regard to uh, studies and, and sharing data. And I think that what we uh, are not, what we were not good at doing a decade ago, that is, a, acquiring the data in a way that we are able to share it more freely is actually going to be possible to do in a prospective way. So, you know, with, as someone who had worked in a retrospective uh, space, as well as working in a prospective space, the way we're collecting the data, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to be much uh, better at sharing data. And, you know, but we, we do live in a, in a legacy of, you know, of a very rigid data sets that, you know, had to live in the closed boxes and there was no communication, but we are expanding the capabilities of that. I, I think that's an excellent point. And, and this is such a fast moving field, of course, that, that, that we're kind of learning as we go on this stuff, aren't we, right? So, so I think this idea of being able to be more prepared for data uh, um, sharing is, is, is an important one. And as is your point on the regulation, I mean, it's there to protect us, there to protect our patients. And what we've seen, I think, uh, for example, more recently with COVID-19 is that regulation can move fast, appropriately fast, but in a way that maintains um, protecting patients, protecting privacy and all those things. And I think, you know, there are solutions that we can have on there that, that can just make sure that we maintain those protections whilst not getting in the way of, of clinical development. Um, a question um, that came from uh, the audience, and it was touching on, on, on uh, Dr. Ross's point about validation of uh, like clinical grade data versus more curated data. And maybe this is something for Matteo and Vesna to comment on. The, the, the question was, are there um, such m m medical neuroimaging data sets out there? Uh, are they readily available to platforms to actually look at the, this data and to find harmonized solutions with that? Does, does, is, can we solve the problem um, that's out there? Are the data sets out there to do it? Let, let me start with Matteo and then, and then maybe Vesna. Yeah, so I think that it's uh, a very interesting uh, um, application of uh, actually AI and uh, deep learning because uh, a lot of effort has been put in actually trying to build uh, super resolution systems where you start with an image that is very low resolution and you go back to the higher resolution that you would like in, uh, in research. And uh, for sure, the data sets are uh, becoming more, uh, more available for these applications. And uh, um, yeah, I think that it's something to be excited on. And it's, uh, it's just a matter of uh, time because before, as we said, these uh, tools uh, go through the pipeline and arrive to the, the final application. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think for, for certain uh, AI tools, or let's say what we call image processing algorithms that's been in the field for, I don't know, for 10, 15 years, like volumetric tools. Uh, there are already published papers that, uh, you know, sh show some differences between data acquired in, I don't know, five minutes versus 15 minutes, 1.5 Tesla versus three Tesla. For new emerging technologies like uh, diffusion, I believe, and Matteo probably, you know, better than me, uh, some years ago uh, from Ikai, there was a challenge, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, where, um, you, you know, it was kind of like a harmonization of diffusion data. And um, this is something that also to some extent uh, applies to the Iron Track challenge because there, uh, you know, on Humanta platform, basically, you, you have the, let's say, the grand truth from a macaque brain from this uh, histology tracing. And then you have the MRI which is really densely scanned, but then, uh, you know, you can sub take sub points and then you can make it similar to like lower resolution and then apply your technique. And then you can, you know, take a higher resolution and compare the results. So definitely there is a lot of, uh, you know, <clears throat> movement in, in that direction. And I think more will come. Awesome. One last quick question, uh, uh, more of a fun question 
Um, so, um, Vesna, what, what's, what's the picture? It's always fascinating with these Zoom calls, right? Some of us go for virtual environments. I am, I'm not in the Cumenta office. This is a, 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 a piece of wallpaper. Matthias always impresses me with his, his book collection. Uh, O'Brien has gone uh, for the lounge solution. Uh, Matteo in Sussex, he's showcasing uh, so forth. Uh, Vesna appears to have someone's brain. Uh, um, which is a, a, a choice. So t tell us the story of the brain here. Yeah, actually, this is uh, Paolo's brain, the other co-founder of Cumenta. And what we did, we decided to do something fun with AI. So we used deep learning. Uh, this is his actual MRI scan, a sagittal scan, uh, one slice, basically with, uh, with the diffusion fiber tracks. So uh, just for fun, we, we decided to, you know, borrow a style from different artists like Van Gogh and, uh, you know, even from Gaudi, like from the architecture, and then make the neural network understand how this painter is painting and then apply to real imaging data. So this is uh, basically from the 20th century Impressionism, I think. Uh, Basically, the, the, the ne convolutional neural network learned the style and then applied it to Paolo's brain. And um, we actually bought this. So we made a, an exhibition um, uh, that was, uh, I guess, two years ago <laughs> before COVID when we could do this kind of event. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was for a good cause for a children's hospital. Uh, and, you know, we use it for fun, for marketing purposes. But I think uh, it, it's something pretty cool. And, uh, you know, sometimes I have from my brain where it looks really like, uh, you know, Ramon and Cajal's, um, you know, drawings. Uh, and uh, it, it's something fun. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, ni ni nice to see um, AI and medicine combining with art um, with something cute there. So that's, that's fantastic. So listen, with that, I, I, I think we're out of time. Um, I just want to say, first again, um, what a fantastic session, uh, really fabulous, really interesting, uh, great discussion, great debate. I wanna thank Natalia, uh, Brian, Matteo, Besner, and particularly Matthias for, for facilitating uh, such a brilliant discussion. Thank you all so much. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, those of you attending, you will get a follow-up survey. I do encourage you to respond to that. Uh, as you can see from the slide I put up, um, we have a, a, another webinar coming up uh, next month, uh, provocatively titled um, Neurological Imaging Trials, uh, uh, sorry, Neurological Clinical Trials Are Failing, How Can We Fix Them? Um, that's on the 15th of April. Vesna is going to be uh, joined by uh, Dr. Bruce Rosen, a professor of radiology at Harvard, one of the fathers of functional MRI, as I think Brian knows, uh, knows well, uh, just a tremendous speaker. Um, should be a fantastic session. So look out for the invitation to, to that or come visit the website at cumento.com to learn more. But with that, once more, thank you so much panelists for an amazing uh, conversation. This session will be recorded and will be shared later. So um, you have an opportunity to rewatch or share with your, with your friends and colleagues. With that, we'll close the session. And again, thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.